Hey dad, it's me, your favorite son. Oh, what a fucker watch this shit. No. 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 Okay, Welcome back fine. to volume two of ranking PS2 games from my childhood. Last time we poured through the box, a crate of video games that I used to play when I was a kid. We ranked seven games. If you missed it, go watch volume one now to see me talk about those. These are the current rankings. I had to make some adjustments to the list. I removed one game entirely, Ghost Recon, because the disc just didn't work. And I added two more, which I somehow forgot to put on the list entirely last time. Prince of Persia and Prince of Persia Two Thrones. But we'll be talking about those games in the next video, so don't hold your breath. This time, we'll be looking at 10 new games and adding them to the rankings. I'm here to see if these games still hold up or change my mind on some games I didn't like when I was a kid. These are the contents of the box in alphabetical order. Just to reiterate, I'm not rating these games, I'm just ranking them on this tier list. Without further ado, Pappy, let's talk about some games. Hitman is a series of stealth action games developed by Eidos Interactive, one that's still being added to today. This thing is fucking hot. I am a consummate professional. I'm a professional. <laughs> They're flat. They're flat. Uh, all right. I'd like to preface this by saying I'm not a stealth guy. I've never really played stealth games. Even the optional stealth levels in games like Far Cry or The Last of Us gave me a certain amount of anxiety. This really comes down to impatience and my ability to wait or lack thereof. My first inclination is to blast through the baddies, not wait for them to walk by and take them out with my wits. I talk about video games on the internet. I don't have wits. That being said, when I was young, I didn't take to Hitman particularly well. I would boot up Hitman 2 Silent Assassin, get caught immediately, and quit out of frustration. <coughs> My young boy mush brain wasn't ready for the complexity these games had to offer. My adult boy mush brain was also not ready for the complexity these games had to offer. The series started with Hitman codename 47 on Windows. The three games we'll be talking about pick up directly after that, Hitman 2 Silent Assassin, Hitman Contracts, and Hitman Blood Money. In Hitman, you play as Agent 47, a clone who was created to be the ultimate assassin. In the end of the first game, he learns where he comes from and decides to give up his life of murder and live peacefully. Hitman 2 sees Agent 47 living in Sicily with a priest named Father Vittorio. Father Vittorio is kidnapped and Agent 47 decides to pick up his guns one more time to rescue his mentor. He gets back in contact with the ICA, the agency he does contracts for, and gets their assistance. 47 finds Father Vittorio, but the kidnappers escape with him before he can get to the priest. After this, the agency still wants repayment in the form of Agent 47's services. You spend the rest of the game killing targets for the ICA. At the end of the game, 47 learns that one of the men responsible for creating him captured Father Vittorio to bring him out of retirement. After 47 rescues his mentor, he hands hands him a rosary and tells him to leave this life behind. Agent 47 leaves the rosary at the door and officially rejoins the ICA. Hitman 2 is broken up into missions. You travel the world to kill targets for the ICA. Each mission has its own dossier with information on the target and the best possible ways to approach the situation. It's It doesn't feel that hot, but I know under here I'm sweating a lot. I look like fucking Gollum. I'm taking my precious on date. Hitman 2's allure, and possibly the promise of the entire series, is its open-ended nature. In Hitman, you can approach each mission in tons of different ways. You can pose as a pizza boy or a butcher to get closer to your target. You can climb into the sewers and take the underground route. Or, my personal favorite, you can kill every living being in sight. You see, though I'm an adult, like I said before, I still have mush brain. I don't have the attention span to sit and wait for a guard to walk by and take him out with fiber wire. I want to watch TikToks, not 37-minute YouTube videos. 
The freedom and level of depth that Hitman offers you is definitely its strong point. You can get creative with the kills or you can just run and gun. Each level feels expertly crafted with multiple escape routes and different points of entry. A variety of different disguises and methods of murder make this game the assassin simulator that it is. Hitman Contracts picks up a year after Hitman 2. Agent 47 is mortally wounded during a mission and reflects on his past hits. First, he remembers murdering his creator, Dr. Ortmeier, and escaping the sanatorium. One by one, he recalls various contracts he's performed throughout the years. Eventually, an ICA doctor performs emergency surgery on Agent 47, but not before Giggin, storms the building. This is what Giggin stands for, I'm not gonna pronounce that. 47 then remembers he had already taken out two of the three targets in his mission, and a corrupt Giggin officer was the last. The same officer was responsible for his wound. He escapes to the streets and takes out his target before boarding a plane with his ICA handler, Diana. She tells him that the Giggin is trying to take down the ICA setting up the next entry in the series. Contracts takes Hitman's formula and upgrades every piece just a little bit. The UI looks a little more smooth and there's just more to do, more disguises, more weapons, and better interactivity. Each level feels like its own story and playing as 47 feels like trying to flow well into that story. Where Silent Assassin felt like disrupting the situation, Contracts feels like playing your part on the stage. It takes Silent Assassin's world-spanning spy drama and replaces it with a psychological examination of 47 himself. Blood Money doesn't do this and kind of goes off the rails. It starts with a journalist interviewing the former FBI director and telling him all about Agent 47, who is believed to be an urban legend. After an attack on the White House, the franchise is trying to take down the ICA and Agent 47 himself. Eventually, the ICA is taken down and the remaining is divided between 47 and his handler, Diana. Diana double crosses 47 and poisons him, but then at his funeral, she kisses him with antidote-laced lipstick, double-double-crossing him. 47 then wakes up and murders everyone at the funeral keeping his identity a secret. Diana reopens the ICA and 47 embarks on his next mission. Blood Money introduces many new mechanics, such as using NPCs as shields, upgradable weapons, and a new engine that feels like it flows a lot better on the console. Previous installments very much felt like they were for the PC but this one feels like it shines on the PS2. Each game feels like it upgrades the series in significant ways. The stakes just get higher and higher each time. I won't say that each game is better than the last. Personally, I prefer two over the others, but that's just my opinion. The soundtrack for all three games really comes through. Hitman is filled with booming and harmonic orchestral arrangements that almost feel biblical in scope. Hitman is a great series, and its ability to give the player freedom and room to do what they like is where it really shines. It makes you feel like Agent 47. You feel the responsibility and weight of each target on your shoulders. There's a job to do, and you're the only man to do it. I give the Hitman trilogy an A. All right, I can take his fucking ball cap off. Clock Tower 3 is a survival horror game developed by Capcom and Sunsoft, released in 2002 in Japan and 2003 in North America. You play as Alyssa Hamilton, a girl who can time travel and see spirits. I can time travel and see spirits. From this side? That's Reba. I'm Reba. I can see spirits. Your goal in each level is to find the truth of the spirit's death and find a memento that will help the spirit reconcile and move on to the afterlife. You are constantly plagued by spirits and subordinates, the bosses of each level. Alyssa can't fight outside of boss battles, so your only option is to run and hide. Each level consists of various puzzles to solve, and making your way through each story feels revealing and interesting. The whole game feels pressured and frankly terrifying. The music, environment, and enemies all combine to form an atmosphere that makes you panicked. Speaking of panic, Alyssa doesn't have a health bar, she has a panic meter. Being scared or getting attacked will 
cause her panic meter to rise. If it reaches full, she will become panicked, a state where she can't fully control her movements or use her holy water. Your trusty vial of holy water helps you to briefly fend off spirits and subordinates and will break seals on certain doors. At the beginning of the game, Alyssa is at boarding school but she soon receives a letter from her mother telling her to hide until her 15th birthday. Of course, she doesn't listen because we're Alyssa and we don't listen to our mommies. She heads back home and discovers a man staying there named the Dark Gentleman, but no mommy. She finds a letter from her mother and a vial of holy water and is transported back in time to 1942 during World War II. Alyssa explores the city, helping spirits that she finds along the way. Eventually, she finds a tailor shop and witnesses the past murder of a young girl there by a serial killer named Sledgehammer. Alyssa starts to piece together the story of the murder and finds a memento of the young girl that was murdered there. Her name was May. She goes to return the memento to May's ghost and is confronted by the killer. Her holy water turns into a longbow and she destroys Sledgehammer in a rain of golden light. Alyssa gives May the memento and confronts her before her and her father move on to the afterlife. One thing I thought that was cool about the boss battles is it shows the sentencing time for each killer and that determines how much their health bar is filled. Alyssa wakes back up in her house and enters her grandfather's room in which she finds information about the phenomena she's experiencing. She learns that she's something called a rooter, a woman who has the ability to speak to and free the dead. She then travels back to 1963 and finds a mother and son who are blind and are endlessly searching for each other. This is horrifying imagery. She finds out that they were murdered by a man named the Corroder, who burned them with sulfuric acid. She frees the spirits and defeats the Corroder before returning back to her present day home. She finds out that the dark gentleman in her home hopes to become immortal with the heart of a Rooter. This is where the story gets a little Japanese horror, if you know what I mean. Alyssa then starts reliving memories. One in particular is her father being murdered by her grandfather. She travels back and finds two subordinates called the Scissor Twins, who are being controlled by a man named Burroughs. A clock tower appears above the house, and Alyssa must meet the dark gentleman there if she wants to save her mother. Her grandfather is the real villain who has been researching and plotting against the Rooters this entire time. There's a big final battle, some power transfers, some sacrifices, and Alyssa defeats Burroughs and her grandfather. The game ends with Alyssa and her mother being reunited and the clock tower destroyed. We did it! We saved mommy. Clock Tower 3 is a beautiful game and its ability to build an atmosphere that terrifies and penetrates is truly amazing. Everything from the sound design to the placement of holy water wells is purposeful. It makes your heart pump and when you're playing horror, that's exactly what you want. Clock Tower 3 gives you exactly what you want, no more, no less. I give Clock Tower 3 an S. I'm a survivor. Aragon is an action-adventure video game developed by Vivendi Games and published by Sierra. All right, I, I'm gonna be honest, I could not find a costume for Aragon, and it's also kind of not really worth a costume, so. It's an adaptation of the 2006 film of the same name, which is an adaptation of the 2002 book of the same name. I can't speak to the validity of either of these adaptations. I have read the second book in the series and seen the movie once. What I can speak to is this game's monstrous mess of mechanics and story. First off, there isn't really a story. I mean, there is, but it's mostly just a narration that's completely glossed over. Large chunks of the world, lore, and what's even going on is just one line that's swept under the rug and never talked about again. This game definitely has the stench of adaptations of its time where it already expected you to have seen the movie. It vaguely reminds me of some of the Lord of the Rings games, but much worse. Aragon has multiple different combos and attacks, but methodically planning out each battle doesn't work as well as just mashing X and circle back and forth again. Most of the enemies just die immediately, and the ones that don't 
really don't do much damage to you. Aragon has magic that he can use to lift spears and throw them at enemies or move objects in the world, which would feel cool and interesting if it wasn't just a prompted environment object that requires you to hold a button and does the whole thing for you. I feel like I'm expecting too much from the Aragon game. The fixed camera is really what ruins this game for me. It's the most inconvenient thing possible. Another game on this list, Clock Tower 3, has a fixed camera, which feels nuanced and like it adds to the atmosphere of the game. This just feels janky and pointless. This game also just looks terrible. I don't know if it's the aesthetic that they were trying to go for, trying to recreate this movie in the game world, but it just doesn't come off well. Take Kingdom Hearts 2, for example, which came out a year before this game in 2005, and compare it to this gray, drab, beige-toned thing. There just doesn't really feel like there's any style here. You could have put any other name on this game and it wouldn't have changed a thing. I don't really have much to say about this game and I don't want to give it too much time because I have a sneaking suspicion that the production was motivated by cash. 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 I give Aragon a D. Cash. Bully is an action-adventure video game developed by Rockstar. It's similar to other Rockstar games, except that it takes place at a boarding school. Do I look like the bully? I'm supposed to look like the bully. I don't look like the bully. This is all I could find at the thrift store. Good enough. You play as a young kid named James Hopkins who has been expelled and sent off to Bullworth Academy. You get into plenty of shenanigans at Bullworth, everything from setting off fireworks in the school to stealing panties. Oh yeah. I have to say, Bully was one of my favorite games as a kid. I played and replayed this game more times than I can count. This game still resonates with me today. It was what I always wanted GTA to be when I was a kid. There's big differences between this game and those games, which we'll get into later, but Bully just appealed to my tastes so much more. It felt like this world had so much more to do, so much more to offer. Bully starts with James, Sorry, Jimmy. Hey, Jimmy. Being expelled from high school and sent off to Bullworth Academy. He meets a cast of characters at the school, Crabble Snitch, the principal, Gary, the cocky senior, and Petey, the whiny freshman. Gary and Jimmy's friendship doesn't last long because Gary quickly betrays him and forces him to fight the bully's leader. Bully has multiple different cliques in its world. The bullies, jocks, greasers, preppies, and nerds. Jimmy spends his next few months at school trying to get respect from the various cliques at Bullworth. His actions range from getting a greaser relationship back together to taking nudes of the head cheerleader for one of the gross nerds. After Jimmy gains respect of all five of the cliques, he is expelled after Gary pins the vandalism of the town hall on him. Gary eventually takes over the entire school and enacts a full-on war between the cliques. Jimmy infiltrates the school and has his final battle with Gary on the rooftop, the aftermath of which gets Gary expelled and Jimmy is now able to return to school. Bully's story is outlandish and over the top, but it exemplifies the cliches of school in the minds of the yet have gones and in the minds of the nostalgic. It also ramps up the tropes of the oh-so-popular high school movie genre. The world of Bully reflects this as well. It's much more sized down, but because Jimmy can only traverse by bicycle, foot, or skateboard, it feels much larger. You feel like a kid in high school, where this town outside is all you know, and the walls of the school are massive. And the people walking around the school aren't just random copy-and-paste NPCs. They're all people you know, whether they appear in side quests or the main story. While Bully's story is fantastic, the real draw is everything outside. 
aside. The game added and changed so much of the Rockstar formula. You have certain times of the day when you have to attend class, which is rewarded with new weapons or abilities. Each class is a small, slightly different minigame. You can even do odd jobs around the school to earn money, like mowing the grass. These things sound tedious, but they really do help to break up the gameplay. I really feel like Bully is one of Rockstar's most overlooked games. Today, it's kind of chunky and odd gameplay, don't compare to the likes of GTA 5 or Red Dead 2. But upon its release, I feel like Rockstar was just starting to break that GTA barrier a little bit. That being said, Bully's gameplay does feel a bit dated compared to the Rockstar games of today. It's a little slow and a little chunky, but its interesting story, fun side quests, and genius world make it a treat to revisit. I give Bully a B for Bully. Tiger Woods PGA Tour is a long-running series of sports games developed by EA, and I think these two entries are kind of disastrously perfect to talk about. Whoa, check it out, I hit that ball super far. Four! Tiger Woods loves Black Bear, well, well-known fact. Well documented fact. I started playing with O3. I figured I would try and start with the old, contrast that with the new, focus on the improvements that the series has made over time. PGA Tour O3 isn't a terrible game, but it doesn't have the things that I get really excited about in these games. I'm not a golf guy at all, but when I was younger, the allure of these games was the customization and leveling of your character. Surprising, I know, I liked the RPG elements. I also really liked buying outfits and making sponsorship deals. The actual playing golf was always a side interest to me. In 03, you don't have all those crazy additions that I loved, but that doesn't make it a bad golf game. It works really well. You can put spin on your ball, you can do power shots. The whole system is pretty accurate. I just wanted a larger my career mode to really top it all off. After I got bored of 03, I wanted to see what 08 was all about. I figured it would steal the show with its graphical and technical improvements. Boy was I wrong. 08 has a surprisingly cool character customizer, which I was excited about. As I was making my character, I was envisioning this whole backstory. He was gonna be like this random crackhead that wandered onto a golf course, but by some miracle, he was like a golf prodigy. So they let him into the PGA Tour, but he can't stop doing crack. This was all well and good, until the game crashed. Odd, but not unexpected. A lot of these games so far have given me trouble. They're mostly all 20 years old, and the discs haven't been taken great care of. Until it happened again, and again, and the game started lagging all the time. Eventually, I just figured I could emulate the game to get the footage I need, because something must be wrong with my disc. But upon further research, I found that 08 was actually notorious for its graphical glitches and crashes at the time. There was even a specific glitch called the Jesus shot where the golfer you were using at the time would take a shot from the water, but they would be standing on top of it. This could be because they released this game as well for the PS3, and they were probably trying to stretch the PS2 pretty thin at the time. Regardless, I didn't play very much of 08. In the end, 03 is a decent golf game. I wouldn't rush over to eBay to try and grab yourself a copy, but in hindsight, it isn't terrible, and it surprised me with how not dated it was. 08 surprised me with how dated it actually was and how much it didn't work. I give Tiger Woods PGA Tour 03 and 08 a combined C. Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty is a stealth action game developed by Konami and directed by Hideo Kojima. Boo. Boo. It's the sequel to Metal Gear Solid, and I'll just spoil it up front, Metal Gear is probably my favorite video game series of all time. A lot has been said about Metal Gear Solid over the years, so I'm gonna try and not retread old ground. I'll try to make my statements as original and brief as possible. If you'd like to watch an amazing deep dive on Metal Gear Solid 2, I would recommend Paper Starship's Metal Gear Solid 2 is a masterpiece. In Metal Gear Solid 2, you play as Solid Snake until you don't, who is stealthily invading a tanker that is supposedly housing the newest Metal Gear. The tanker goes down and Snake with it, 
Now you're playing as Raiden. This is probably one of the biggest bait and switches in the history of video games. Everyone knows it, and now it's looked back on as a wildly genius troll slash subversion. At the time of its release though, it was hated by fans and Raiden was panned. That can also be said for the game itself. Critics praised it for its revolutionary graphics, poignant message, and interesting mechanics, but fans just wanted to play as Snake. I do remember the first time I read about MGS2 in Game Informer, and the article was all about how much fans hated Raiden. I will say I didn't love MGS2, as a kid that came later when I was a teenager and an adult. Metal Gear Solid is stealth at its core. You run around various maps chasing objectives, trying to sneak and creep sneak and creep creep your way through fighting bosses along the way. This game introduced disguises to the series, it developed graphically and changed the atmosphere while also introducing a narrative that developed the mythos of Solid Snake himself. I'm not going to talk too much about the story specifically, I feel that giving a complete synopsis here would be kind of pointless. But the important point is that the story revolves around ideas. The ideas it revolves around are control of information in the digital age, conspiracy theory, social engineering, artificial intelligence, and many more. All ideas that are just as, if not more poignant today than they were 20 years ago when this game was released. Metal Gear Solid 2 has some of the most haunting and poignant dialogue I've seen in a video game. Its words rang in my ears when I played it at 10, 15, 20, and will still be there when I'm thinking about it at 40. Its staying power is what makes it truly special. The tricks of Metal Gear Solid have always been interesting to me as well. This could be said the same for the entire Metal Gear series, but the game messes with you. It will give you fake game over screens to try and get you to quit playing. I'm fucking this. I look like Danny DeVito. This fuck. Even Metal Gear Solid 1 has the infamous Psycho Mantis reading your memory card. Metal Gear Solid 4 has Otacon lamenting that you need a second disc, but it isn't there because they have Blu-ray technology now. All these tricks in the Metal Gear games were so revolutionary and amazing at the time. They always blew my mind, and one thing I don't see people talking about is why. These tricks aren't anything insane. Risks, sure, but you could go into Steam and find 20 games today that do the same exact thing. But why was it so special when Metal Gear Solid 2 did this in 2001? Because this was a triple A blockbuster game that was tricking us. It wasn't a small indie studio, it was Konami. And by trying to trick us, by switching our protagonist, by telling us to quit playing, they were taking a risk. Risking a massive franchise opportunity just to deliver extra narrative punch or put something cool in. Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty delivers a narrative that has managed to become prophetic over its 20 years. It has built-in elements of design that still managed to wow me in 2021. Its characters, mythos, and legend has elevated it above the rest, and it stands as a cultural touchstone at this point. Because of those things, and because MGS2 hasn't aged a day, I give it a double S. Whoa, bet you didn't see that coming. Yeah, double S. It's really good. Kingdom Hearts 2 is an action-adventure game developed by Square Enix. All right, enough with the costumes. I didn't have a, a costume for Kingdom Hearts 2. I'm not going in-depth into the cosplay world. So we're just gonna get comfy and casual. Kingdom Hearts has quite the reputation. It's an amazing series with fantastic, fun gameplay and a wild, admittedly confusing story. If you don't already know what Kingdom Hearts is, it's a game about destroying the heartless, finding your friends, and saving the world or rather, multiple Disney-themed worlds. This is another game I wasn't very excited to talk about just because of the mythos surrounding it. I loved this game as a kid and still do to this day, but in this revisiting, I wanna talk about one part of the game 
that I didn't appreciate very much as a kid. When I played the first Kingdom Hearts, a game in which you play as Sora, joined with his pals Donald and Goofy, I was obsessed. It had Disney-themed worlds, great characters, and it was just fun. So of course I was excited for a sequel. When I finally got to play it though, I was confused. In the beginning, you start out controlling a new character. Roxas. Roxas is a kid just trying to enjoy his last few days of summer vacation with his friends. Slowly, over one week, the town starts unraveling and he starts remembering things he's never seen before. Roxas is seeing Sora's adventures from the first game. Eventually, he learns that he is Sora's other half. Sort of. That's a little bit more complicated, I'm not gonna get into that here. His whole town was a simulation, and he's actually a member of a group called Organization 13. He has to leave everything he knows, his friends, his town, and as far as we know, his life, just so Sora can wake up and he does it. The whole sequence lasts about three hours, and as a kid, I was kind of annoyed. I just wanted to play as Sora. Where was Donald? Where was Goofy? Riku? Kairi? Once I got to play as Sora, I was ready to move on and just forget about that whole thing. As an adult, though, I think this intro is genius. This whole thing is a tortured story of Roxas, someone who doesn't know who or what he is, and what's going on around him. Once he finds out the answers to these questions, he doesn't like them. We're playing as a pawn in someone else's game, someone who is just there to serve the main character. And when you finally do get to play as Sora, you feel kind of bad. Everyone is trying to push Roxas to wake Sora up, the characters in the game, and you, the player. But once he does, it feels bittersweet. You've gotten your character, gluttonous gamer man, but at what cost? This bait and switch is kind of the opposite of MGS2. In that game, you're playing as the fan favorite before you're switched out for this new guy. In this game, you're playing as this new guy before you're switched out for the fan favorite. The other genius part of this intro is the confusion. Roxas is confused, but so are you. You have someone to be confused along with. Your reaction is a reflection of what he is feeling in the game. Kingdom Hearts 2 is one of my favorite games of all time. The gameplay is tight and the RPG systems work very well. The story is insane, off the walls, and makes very little sense, but it wears its madness on its sleeve unabashedly. Of course, Kingdom Hearts 2 still holds up as it gets an S. If you stuck around this long, thank you for watching. I appreciate it. Um, if you liked this content, like and subscribe. I should have one more volume of this series coming soon. And after that, uh, I have a lot more stuff planned. So if you've been liking the past videos, uh, like, subscribe. You can follow me on Twitter. Um, thanks.